I just want to welcome everyone to tonight's Artist and Artist Lecture Series. It's the last of the spring, and it's really a, a wonderful pleasure to have Charles Gaines speaking on Robert Ryman. Um, there are going to be maybe a few people coming in late, so just be mindful of that. Hopefully they won't make too much noise. I'm Kelly Kivlin. I'm Associate Curator here at DIA. And um, this series has been actually a part of DIA's programming since 2001. Um, not a lot of people know that, but we've had, a, I think, over 100 artists present in the series. And I wanted to actually mention that we're undergoing a, um, a website redesign. And come, I think, near the end of summer, most of our artists and artist lectures will be available to view online. So if you have interest in looking at our past um, talks, you're welcome to do so then. And it's actually quite a journey. And there's actually some people in the room here tonight that have been a part of the series, so that's always wonderful to see as well. Um, I just want to thank a couple people, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for support of the series, as well as to Brooklyn Brewery for the beer. And I'm thrilled to introduce Courtney J. Martin, who is a curator of, the current, of Dia's current Robert Ryman exhibition that's actually next door at 545 West 22nd Street. If you haven't yet seen the exhibition, go see it, go see it again. It, it, it's so worth it. And uh, it closes the end of July, so you have plenty of time. Martin is the assistant professor in the History of Art and Architecture Department at Brown University. She received a doctorate from Yale University for her research on 20th century British art. Since 2008, she has co-directed a research project on the Anglo-American critic and curator Lawrence Alloway at the Getty Research Institute and is co-editor of Lawrence Alloway, Critic and Curator, Getty Publications 2015. She is also the editor of the forthcoming volume, Four Generations, the Joiner Graffita, Collection of Abstract Art. And in, tw in 2012 to 2013, she curated Drop, Roll, Slide, and Drip, Frank Bowling's Poured Paintings, 1973 to 78, at the Tate Britain in London. And in 2014, she, I'm gonna go for it, Courtney, she co-organized the group show Minimal Baroque, Post-Minimalism and the C Contemporary Art at, maybe I'll, Rana Bokshoin, Nested, Denmark? Okay, it was close enough. <laughs> Courtney will correct me. In 2015, she received an Andy Warhol Foundation's Arts Writers Grant. Thank you again, and please join me in welcoming Courtney Martin, who will introduce Charles Gaines. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I met Charles Gaines for the first time in January 2005 in Houston, Texas. I remember this, this meeting for several reasons. Um, coming from New York, Houston was hot, like it is here today, and humid. Um, but coming from Los Angeles, Charles wore a jacket the whole time that we were there and seemed to find the cool breeze that was otherwise elusive to the rest of us. This was the first time that I heard him explain the seemingly limitless expansiveness of his systems-based art practice. He showed me that I had to let go of the rigidity of the numeral to see it as a shape, full with the possibility of mutability like any other form. Several years later, I asked him about his use of numbers. If they came out of a questioning about where things ended or where things were going, and he answered with the following, quote, for the most part, I think my interest in systems was a result of moving away from the idea of willfulness. And those causal frameworks to causality in general, where there is a metonymic relationship, a cause and an effect. So systems were autonomously self-operating structures. From this, you can easily see that it is no surprise that Charles has taught extensively over the last 40 years. First at California State University, Fresno, where he taught until 1990, and thereafter at the California Institute of the Arts near Los Angeles, where he currently lives and works. But Charles was born in Charleston, South Carolina, and raised in Newark, New Jersey. After completing a first degree at Jersey City State College, he received his MFA from the Rochester Institute of Technology in 1967. At RIT, 
Charles moved away from a painting practice into one that embraced conceptual art. Early in his career, he was the subject of several solo exhibitions and was included in the 1975 Whitney Biennial. Two years later, he was awarded a National Endowment for the Arts grant. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Charles showed in and interacted extensively with artists from New York, among them Robert Ryman. More recently, Charles has been the subject of several one-person exhibitions, including the major surveys Charles Gaines in the Shadows of Numbers held at the Pomona College Museum of Art and the Pitzer College Art Gallery, both in Claremont, California, and Charles Gaines' Gridworks, 1974 to 1989, which originated at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 2014, before traveling to the Hammer Museum in LA. It was my great pleasure to be invited to interview Charles for the catalog that accompanied that exhibition. In 2014, he participated in the Montreal Biennial and the 2007 and 2015 Venice Biennales. In between, he was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship in 2013. In addition to his own practice, Charles is a noted writer and curator. His 1993 show at the University of California Irvine's gallery, Theater of Refusal, Black Art and Mainstream Criticism, brought the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat, David Hammonds, Ben Patterson, Adrian Piper, and others together to examine the ways in which race framed the critical reception of artists working in the 80s and 90s. Tonight, Charles may tell us a bit about his interactions with Robert Ryman and maybe a bit more about his own practice. Please join me in welcoming Charles Gaines. I, I really want to uh, communicate my appreciation to, to Dia for giving me the opportunity to um, make these comments on uh, Ryman's work. And, um, and interesting because I didn't really know him. I met him, um, it, it just so happened that I was, uh, uh, we were, uh, I, at the time that I joined the John Weber Gallery in, in, in the late 70s, he was uh, still in, uh, there and, uh, and an exhibiting artist there. And I would see him only in, uh, through uh, the door of Weber's office. And, you know, he seemed to be this mythical figure that's, uh, that lurked, lurked around the office there, but never had the opportunity to, to meet him. And, and, and a lot of things I didn't know about him, but for example, the, for example the, the fact that he was a jazz musician before he became an artist, that he, he transitioned from jazz through, uh, into art. For some reason, um, his experience as a guard at one of the museums in New York helped him or convinced him to become an artist. Um, but that's, that's something that's common because I was also trained as a jazz musician and I played uh, professionally as a very young person. And, uh, but I was already uh, invested in art. It was something where I, I, I wasn't, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, that I didn't know about. Uh, I, I, I actually had to make the decision to, uh, when I decided to go to graduate school, to stop playing. And... Um, but you know, of course, playing had always continued to be a part of my life uh, ever since. Uh, so, um, and then I was also was interested in, in what relationship that his um, experience as a musician had on, on his, his his practice. The paper that I'm going to read isn't going to engage that. But the, but one of the things I was interested in in is that I couldn't for many, many years find a way of making a relationship between my interest in music and, and my visual practice. And, and it's something that seemed to be part of Ryman's transition into art, it's his experience as a jazz musician. The paper that uh, I'm going to uh, read to you is, is simply uh, uh, some reflections that I have on, um, on some of the, the ideas that have been written about Ryman over the years. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I guess I'll just begin to do that. If I can move this microphone out of the way. <clears throat> can you still hear me? Am I all right? Yeah, all right. 
Uh, in any painting, uh, is any painting blank? Is white almost like nothing there? Ryman has been described as a modernist ascetic or a postmodern hybrid, a cross between a modernist and an anti-modernist. He rallied around ideas that privileged the painting as object, but obscured this reality by camouflaging the object, by making it almost indistinguishable, indistinguishable from practices of installation and architecture, hence blurring the distinction between painting, sculpture, and architecture. Is he affirming or deconstructing the idea of, empirical art, of the empirical art object? In the space of this uncertainty, there are a few positions we can confidently stake out with respect to Ryman. He is, suspiciously, he is suspicious of art criticism. Perhaps this is because of its inability to sufficiently explain the world. Language often seems arbitrary in assessing the meaning of what we experience. What something is might be more authentic than what something means. And with Ryman, questions of the authentic are directed toward the practice of painting because it may be that criticism obfuscates the object in the maze of subjective interpretation. In fact, Ryman considers the painting an object, not just a surface upon which to imagine forms and images. Another position of Ryman's is that he prefers Matisse and Klein to Reinhardt and Stella. He particularly loves Matisse's brushwork, and he is closer to Rothko in that the work is simple and minimal, but also and perhaps paradoxically subtle and nuanced. It seems that Ryman considers the brush stroke an objective property of painting. It reveals what was often referred to in minimalist and post-minimalist work, the property of materials, or what Focion called their reciprocal fitness. It displays texture and viscosity. It reveals transparency and opacity. It shows the full constitution of the labor of its production. This is a nod to the idea of the autonomous art object, that there are qualities and materials that are natural and not a product of design, that are not an expression of human will or intention. There is no brushwork in Stella or Reinhardt but there is in Matisse and Klein. And because of the imagistic qualities in brushwork, Ryman can offer the idea of the painterly as an objective property of the painting. In 1957, Ryman developed brushwork as a non-pictorial element. He laid them out across the picture plane while exploiting their nuanced gestural quality, not as design, but as a function of the quality of the material, paint, applied thusly. The sense of undulation provoked by the natural thick to thin dispersion of the pigment echoed the poetic. However, the facticity of paint application gave the brushwork the sense of the routine and the unaffected. It, in aggregate, the brushwork was more like bricks laid out as a wall rather than elements in the construction of an image. We have additionally, as evidence to Ryman's interest in the objective and the real, a 1991 lecture where he used the term realism to describe his work. Clearly, this interest is the real, in the real linked him to minimalism and to documentary, I'm saying documentarian conceptualism. Actually, that's a category I just made up. Uh, <laughs> it seems that the scene of Ryman's experiments in objectification is located in the space between the image and the material. The binary here is the real, matter, versus the image, representation, where the painting is comprised of objective properties rather than the use of those properties to imagine an image or a form. An example is untitled 1958, where the brush stroke exists as an autonomous element that aggregates with other strokes without creating an illusion. This produces the brushwork as a trope of labor rather than the tool of the imagination and forms an equivalency with other objective properties of a painting, such as the canvas and the stretcher. Ryman's interest in the brushstroke as separated from the image introduces the binary of the real versus the illusion, where the illusion is an image that we perceive in the properties of material that is in fact real or actual. This is why something as complexly provocative like a brushstroke can stand for an objective property. In other words, 
Ryman's work operates within this binary where the object is trapped in a space between the real and the illusion. Uh, something like the ink stain of the Rorschach test that looks like, say, a duck. It is an image trapped between the happenstance, the ink stain, and the intentional psychological image recognition. In this case, in spite of image recognition, this ink stain remains a trope of the real. It remains a thing and not a representation. Ryman's stroke is, is similarly trapped within this binary where the illusion is found in its identity as a gesture, introducing poetic metaphors of nuance and subtlety. If we compare it to Pollock, his strokes produce images of space and movement. They are fully uh, taken over by the gesture and dedicated to the realization of composition and form. For, Ryman, for Ryman, on the other hand, this is not a phenomenon of the real. Ryman relies on the paradox of the language event, in this case, the painterly gesture as the meaning of stroke, uh, being asserted as real like an object without sacrificing, sacrificing its signifying function, which is to be literally a brush stroke and, be a metaphoric, and to be metaphorically a gesture. And the capacity to do this is based on something more complex, that the stroke as a thing is also a sign, an index of human activity, the record of a human act. And because of this, it is recognizable to painting. The reality of the brushstroke can also be argued propositionally, in other words, as what is real or objective in a painting. Hence, the act of making, pre making presents a thing, an element in the construction of a painting rather than an image in a painting. The scenario is much simpler in ordinary objects. The bricks that are used to build a brick wall never aspire to be images because the wall is not a domain for the construction of images. If we accept the fact that all things come to us as signs, the issue is that a work of art is a unique site for this double requirement of the sign. One, as a thing, a metonym where what we see is interpreted as a thing, and second, a sign where what we see is interpreted metaphorically. After all, Ryman is not a carpenter or a mason where it would be unnecessary to convince us that bricks are real things. He is an artist who is trying to tell us that what has been always considered an expressive act is actually a thing, something like a tool. This proposition requires a closer scrutiny of the idea of the real, which I think for Ryman is the difference between a thing and an image. What are often left out of this calculation are the role uh, that the observer plays as well as the effect of his observation on the, on the object. The importance of this perceptual cognitive function shows up in things like works of art, whereas in ordinary things, these effects are not as important because they are not a factor in our understanding. For example, as we just suggested, we all know what a brick is. Social agreement is so great here that even as it might be, no one thinks that the brick is fundamentally changed as a thing by the act of observation. Uh, for this reason, we think of our experience of the brick as objective. Our subjective interpretations are not necessary to, to the experience. Um, but in works of art, all such observations are mediated by propositions about art. And in the case of art, unlike bricks, there can be new propositions. Under these terms, even the proposition real has to be negotiated through language in order to determine what that condition the real is, uh, what, under what condition the real is being considered. This is so with Ryman's brushwork, because they fall within the domain of a reality where there is no difference between the house painter's brushstroke and an artist's brushstroke. A stroke is a stroke, a thing, but if we can paraphrase Magritte, in a painting, a stroke is not a stroke, which is not paradoxical and most fascinating when considering Ryman because he has to produce an analogy that can claim the brushstroke to be part of the domain of objects like canvas and frames while actually being different from them. He actually has to produce a metaphor of a brushstroke. That is, he has to perform the stroke, to produce it as a thing, and do this by highlighting the characteristics of things. Rather than simplify, Ryman amplifies the complexity of the art object. He has to deconstruct the gesture 
remove it of its psychological and will-driven properties. Then, as Vittorio Colaizzi says in his article, titled How It Works, Stroke Music and Minimalism, in Robert Ryman's early paintings, Ryman must move away from the wrecking and rebuilding techniques of gestural abstraction, unquote, and produce it into something that has the properties of a tool. This is performing the object, a complex reassignment of the sign, not a simplification into the realm of the real from the complexity of representation. The question is, is the brushstroke a thing or a metaphor for a thing? The latter condition being a possibility that painting uniquely provides. Under the terms of thingness, it is difficult to consider the stroke as identical to and in the same category that we assign the cotton canvas, which makes performing its thingness essential. Ryman's adventure into the Rio was different from that of the minimalists and post-minimalists. Painting has the power to mediate objective properties into images, to turn the behavior and activity of matter into an aesthetic, or any mark into an illusion. Stella had the insight to challenge these powers. To do this, he used math, particularly geometry, a purportedly non-psychological language of the picture plane, to undermine representation. He graphed lines along the picture plane in successive and equally measured intervals, producing the modernist grid that Rosalind Krauss says extends the picture plane inf infinitely in all directions along a vertical and horizontal axis. Instead of converting the real into the representational, the gridding of the picture plane neutralizes difference in favor of sameness in each lineal repetition. This means that the entire space operates within one universal visual paradigm, which allows it or anything within it to be understood objectively or empirically. But we need to consider if Stella had been successful in employing the modernist grid to dismantle representation. If, as we noted earlier, the so-called real canon, excuse me, if we, uh, as we noted earlier, the so-called real cannot be experienced directly, but we can indeed determine that there are concepts in the real, then the real would be the case we called natural laws. The real is a domain where we find both objects and things and laws. They are related in as much as laws explain why objects and things exist. The minimalism of Stella attempts to convert painting from a system of representation to an object and in so doing convert an image to an object. He accomplishes this, by, uh, this through empirical observation, the mathematical division of the picture plane. This is not unlike looking at clouds and seeing an image of a face or an animal and displacing the image through an empirical analysis of the material properties of the cloud, kind of like entering the three-dimensional space of the cloud. The explanation that objectifies the image is based in laws that make up what we call knowledge. Webster defines to know as to perceive directly, to be aware of truth and, and factuality of something. The idea of knowledge, the fact of, or condition of knowing is only possible if one is either in the space of the real or has an unmediated access to it. And this latter idea of access is dependent on the idea of a force where the sensible is but an effect of the real, as in a signal, but also its, its product under the idea of laws. This is a platonic construct that justifies how something that is unseen can be accessed. As a law, it becomes true, it becomes knowledge. An object is real as a consequence of the combination of the social agreement of its use and empirical laws that, govern it, that, governs, it in, that governs its sensible properties. For example, gravity cannot be seen directly. It is not an object or a thing, but it exists as a law that explains the effect of one mass upon another. In this case, the law is a stand, uh, the law is a stand in for the object or an object that cannot be seen. Hence the, real, the rationalization of the picture plane into the law of equally distributed vertical and horizontal lines reduces the picture plane to a set of laws that cancels out any hope for the survival 
of an image. It is precisely this equivalence between object, things, and laws that brings us to an inescapable paradox existing at the core of the modernist idea of the real or the impasse that exists between its two main propositions about knowing, subjectivity and objectivity. This is an imbalance noted by Maurice Merleau-Ponty when he says in his, his essay, I and Mind, the secret has been lost for good, it seems. If we ever again find a balance between science and philosophy, between the, quote, our models and the obscurity of the there is, it must be of a new kind, unquote. According to Merleau-Ponty, the grid of parallel lines does not affirm the painting as an object any more than the structure of an object is responsible for its object objectification. The grid and the structure are mere abbreviations of a more complex entity whose true complexity can only be understood in the space between the eye and the mind. As Merleau Ponty points out, the object is given in the act of our vision, but it cannot occupy a totalizing position in this domain that singular singularizes the multiple states of reality of vision. We can only occupy one per perspectival plane at a time, but we know it is one in a multitude. The line is like an event horizon. It reveals a contour, but we find it is one in an infinite number of contours that precede and follow it as we move through time and space. Questions concerning the objectification in the debates of, between the empiricists and the phenomenologists expand this thought. The empiricists argue that laws can in fact explain the reality of objects and things in the world, the thing in itself, whereas the phenomenologists, such as Immanuel Kant, proposed that objects and things in the world cannot be known directly because of the faculty of judgment that exists a priori in all beings, both subjective and objective. Accordingly, a rational universe is only a reflection of our thinking, uh, our thinking or our judgments. It is not an affirmation that the universe is indeed rational. These questions show up in the famous 1922 debate between Albert Einstein and Henri Bergson on the subject of Einstein's idea of time and relativity. Einstein believed that science can reveal the immutable laws of the universe and his relativity theory proves uh, that the ordinary human perception of time and space is an illusion. Time and space are not absolute constructions. They do not exist objectively, especially as laws. Time and space are effects of a more general law, relativity, and not things in themselves. But Bergson argued that empiricism is unable to account for the way we experience time and space and the way we experience them is important. He argued that we experience events sequentially and watch with awe as they unfold what we call time. Bergson's argument did not dispute the legitimacy of relativity theory. He had, in fact, done the math and found it compelling. For him, the issue was not that science could not explain the world in terms of physical laws. The issue is that this method is incapable of addressing the effects of of the psychological interpretation and poetics of on our understanding. He was unwilling to accept that poetic understanding was an illusion, that it wasn't in its own way a truth. We can understand the value of learning the laws that explain how the sun sustains itself, but it is also important that poetics and subjectivity are, are allowed to explain the sun as the chariot racing across the sky. Science cannot measure the value of this to human consciousness. To science, consciousness is a limitation that has to be overcome. Bergson argued that even though relativity explains certain physical laws regarding space-time, it could not take into account the way human consciousness experiences things. And this may have more to do with the perpetuation of culture than can be understood by empirical observations. For example, empirical data shows that sequential time is an illusion, but Bergson said humans perceive time this way. 
This led to his theory of elan vital, or vital impulse, the idea that time was a real force in the perpetuation and moving forward of life itself. For Bergson, the human experience of time illuminated indeterminate aspects of the world, such as change, intuition, and subjectivity. Time as a psychological notion was just as important as Einstein's idea that time was a quantitative construct. They are both realities, and each is different from the other. Einstein argued that such notions such as psychological cognition and perception lead to false understandings. That truth and reality are accessible only if we can overcome the vagaries of human subjectivity and the indeterminacies of human psychology. According to Einstein, the belief that time exists as an independent, autonomous fact is an example of a false understanding perpetuated by human subjectivity. Why live in a world of myth myths, Einstein might surmise, when we can uncover truths? For Bergson, it is human such subjectivity that is responsible for our perceptions of space and time and secures the idea of change and indeterminacy, constructs that science cannot address and in fact dismisses as legitimate experiences. For human subjectivity gives justification for art and philosophy, which as practices, uh, which are practices that also uncover their own truths. But they would be sacrificed and made irrelevant by Einstein's attempt to turn physics into a philosophy. Each man, as the, the, the author of the book that I just uh, referenced, uh, the story of Einstein and Bergson, Jimenez Canales. Each man observes in her book, uh, as she observes in the book, represented one side of salient irreconcilable dichotomies that characterize modernity. This dichotomy has been present in describing the difference between art and science, a polarization that is also at the core of Merleau-Ponty's critique of science, rationalism, and the objective method. Ultimately, it is a product of a problematically irreconcilable split that modernism has ushered in between objectivity and subjectivity, a split that portends many of modernism's failures, or a prime failure that has led to its other failures. The minimalist critique was driven by a belief in the modernist idea of progress, an idea that the war against representation would make, uh, would make possible a more accurate view of art, its function and purpose. Subjectivity interfered with the understanding of the art object in itself, something that exists objectively in the world. Hence, subjectivity was seen to be an anachronism, a relic of a past that had become outmoded and incapable of advancing the idea of progress. The modernist grid was determined to be the tool of empiricism that highlighted the art object in itself, rather than as a dynamic and organic product of the artist's subjectivity. But rather than charting an improvement of the idea of art, modernism unwittingly participated, as we have said, in bifurcating its own field of competency, bringing modernism into a crisis by fatally, fatally polarizing the idea of the human experience, pitting reason against intuition, objectivity against subjectivity, empiricism against phenomenology. We should note that each pole of the opposition is itself a modernist construction, making the conflict permanent and dialectically unresolvable. Frank Stell proposed the grid as the equivalent of the frame and the stretcher bar, but this leaves a gaping hole. As we have already mentioned, the grid for Stell is one of the markers of the painting as object because its only function is to measure space. But in fact, the grid is not equivalent to legitimate ob objective markers such as the canvas and the frame, properties of the painting as object. Even though the grid segments space through equal divisions of the plane, its claim to the status of objective marker is based in a contradiction, that space and time markers are universal, an idea that, as we have seen, is contested by both Einstein and the empiricists and Merleau-Ponty and Bergson. Within the context of a painting, they are actually a function of psychological perception, which makes it vulnerable to the location, experience, and desires of the perceiver. 
A painting doesn't perform the function of a tool, the first claim of its equivalency. Its purpose is more propositional or theoretical rather than functional. For example, in the way a grid works as a ruler in, say, an architectural rendering or a map. Ultimately, the painting is not used to measure space. It offers the grid as an object of speculation and reflection. This is something the grid as a tool does not ask of us. If we can return to Ryman and compare for the moment his use of the brushstroke to Stella's use of the line in the general quest to advance the idea of painting as object, one of the conclusions I make is that unlike the line, the brushstroke embraces a connection to psychology and in those terms negotiates an interpretation of itself as an objective marker. Here we can refer to Merleau-Ponty's analysis of, of line and find that it applies quite well to the brushstroke within the objective language of construction and the visual language of image. Merleau-Ponty describes the line as a complex faculty of perception. We can apply this description to Stella's line segmentation in order to discredit the claim that the line is an empirical marker. I will quote the section in its entirety. There's been, for example, a prosaic conception of the line as a positive attribute and a property of the object in itself. Thus, it is the outer contour of the apple or the border between the plow plowed field and the meadow, considered as present in the world, such that, guided by points taken from the real world, the pencil or brush would only have to pass over them. But the line has been contested by all modern painting, and probably by all painting, as we are led to think by da Vinci's comment in his treatise on painting, quote, the secret of art of drawing is to discover in each object the particular way in which a, a certain fluctuous line, which is, so to speak, its generating axis, is directed through its whole extent, unquote. Both Revesan and Bergson sense something important in this without daring to decipher the oracle all the way. Bergson scarcely looked for the sinuous outline outside living beings, and he rather timidly advanced the idea that the undulating line could be no one of the, in, of the visible lines of the figure, that it is no more here than there, and yet gives the key to the whole. He was on the threshold of that gripping discovery, already familiar to the painters, that there are no lines visible in themselves, that neither the contour of the apple nor the border between field and meadow is in this place or that, that they are always on the near or the far side of the point we look at. They are always between or behind whatever we fix our eyes upon. They are indicated, implicated, and even very imperiously demanded by uh, the things, but they themselves are not things. They were supposed to circumscribe the apple or the meadow, but the apple and the meadow form themselves from themselves and come into visible as if they had come from a pre-spatial world behind the scenes." Unquote. Merleau-Ponty's analysis speaks to the failure or inability of the line to mark a real point in space as contour or shape that separates the object from its field. The reality, he suggests, is that the line represents all that cannot be seen. It is not a border, but a mark of the reality of multiple perspectives that have been seen and have yet to be seen. We understand this to be the product of perception, which highlights the experience of the indeterminate and change in vision. It is also defined effectively by the example of a point in time and space, the gap after the past and before the future. Specifically, the idea of the present in Zeno's paradox. Zeno, the mathematician, asked his students to locate the actual point when an enemy's arrow strikes Achilles' tendon as he flees from battle. Ultimately, that point or moment cannot be found. For any point along the arc of the flight of the arrow, 
that is intended to locate it can itself be infinitely subdivided into multiple points, making this point or the idea of the moment unlocatable, a void in, in other words, unpresentable. Uh, let me comment on Zeno's paradox there that, in fact, uh, what he was um, uh, did was to create a geometry and said the, the, and marked it that the flight of the arrow is an arc, and surmised that the, 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 the mark, mark is constituted of points, and that um, one of those points is the point that struck, struck Zeno, the, uh, Achilles' tendon. But uh, since it's a mathematical equation, it turns out that that point actually becomes a collection of points that can be infinitely subdivided, so that any point can't be an actual point. If we substitute the Zeno's point for the Riemann's brushstroke, we see how Riemann is forming another type of equivalence between the stroke and material properties such as canvas and various types of hardware we find on his paintings. The stroke is a form that, in the context of painting, ambiguously points to both the object and the representation. A point uh, that an, an, an uh, a point, but also an infinity of points. Moreover, Ryman's use of hardware engages the same type of recursive reflection that forms the object-subject relations that we find in his use of the paint stroke. To my mind, there is an understanding that one cannot objectify a painting by making it simpler or reductive, a gesture that suggests that there is an irreducible core to a painting that in this respect makes it similar to a prime number beyond which it disappears. Even though we find in Ryman's work a limited visual language of white paint and hardware that reminds us of things like fasteners, and he creates analogies between construction materials of architecture and art making materials. His found objects operate in the complex gestalt of painting, pointing to what they are not doing as much as what they are doing. Like Merleau-Ponty's line, Ryman employs brushstroke as empirical markers of the painting as object to reveal its contour. And like the line, the contour is dynamic rather than static. He makes the strokes behave within a painting as if they were tools of construction, while maintaining its relationship to the history of objects, the history of objects of speculation and reflection, such as works of art. Oh, yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you again, Charles, for for your dedication and uh, and taking up what um, is often sort of a beguiling subject and uh, artists. And um, I appreciate the no images as well. You really made us focus and consider and imagine the work for ourselves while speaking. I appreciate that. Um, we're going to open up to questions now. Um, if anybody has any, I know it takes some time, some time to sort of resonate. Um, but if anybody has one, I'm happy to sort of pass around the microphone. Take a minute, okay. Um, the fact that he reduced the variables to the extent of having just working in one color, how does that fit into how you see his attack on realism or um, objectivity? Um, the fact that he just eliminated so much of the spectrum and would have just worked in white. Is that, is, is that touch on what you're saying? Yeah. Can I, sorry. Can I just ask you to maybe repeat that? Some people over here can't hear it. I was just asking if um, the fact that he worked in only white uh, later, I mean, through most of his career, um, whether that, um, oof, I lost my, I lost my mojo. <laughs> <laughs> how that touches on how how that reduction in um, variables might allow his exploration of these of objectivity and realism to um, function more effectively. Yeah, uh, the 
the uh, well, I mean, the, the first thing I think I tried to lay out was that uh, that reductive strategy. I, I used the analogy of the line as as a simple as, or contours as, as, an, as uh, to describe the strat his reductive strategy. Um, uh, but, but then, uh, but then um, I, I was attempting to uh, to to explain that it, it was is actually a very complex uh, the, the reduction produced a, a, a very a very complex situation uh, that um, and, and it's principally because um, he the he used you know all these reference to painting that that the the the, the, the stroke the brushwork was is always contextualized painting. Well, we never think of just painting a wall. Uh, uh, we always thinking uh, uh, that, that some aspect of painting language is being undertaken. And even the other, even the more objective uh, properties of, of it uh, are contextualized around the object of painting. And, 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 uh, uh, and, uh, and because of that, I, I, I try to elaborate that metaphor of the contour to, to suggest that uh, that was it, its complexity is more like what um, Merleau Ponty was describing in terms of the line that that is is, is more like making us uh, hyper aware of you know what it is and what it is not that that is that you know this 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 dance between various uh, disciplines like you know sculpture and architecture this this uh, Seamless and, and, and easy, uh, you know, play with constructions of installation. Um, uh, you know, those are all sort of complex parallels that can't be explained by saying that he's reduced something. And, and so the the so, and so the, the metaphor that, that Marilyn Ponte is saying that, that I'm suggesting is is, is that that uh, the, 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 the 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 in actuality a point or a line. Um, it, it, you know, it can be articulated, but what is articulating is 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 not and is this doesn't actually exist. You know, it's like looking at a, a sphere and seeing the, the 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 contour of the sphere, and saying, well, you know, that that is that, that 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 line that I see on, on the sphere it actually exists, but when you actually pick the sphere up and look for it, it's, it's not there. You see, so so it it, it uh, so so I, I prefer. It. I mean, I, I, I there's a lot of parts that Ryman his his suspicion about about subjectivity, the, you know, the idea of affect and will, and is trying to to search for the some idea of the objective to just sort of bypass it. I'm, I'm in total sympathy for it. my own interest in the grid was uh, as, a, as a consequence of that. But I also found in him that the, the thing that interests me in the grid, the, the, the grid wasn't interesting to me because it simplified as a space or objectified a space. The, the grid was interesting to, interesting to me because whatever it gridded, uh, it, you know, that, that it, it, you know, it's, it, it had no problem in gridding, you know, phenomena, but it, it was clear that that act of gridding was a completely random and arbitrary act. act. You know where to make the line in relation to the phenomena. This is complete. So, so I was interested in the the the, the sense of, of of the irrationality of the grid, not the rationality of the grid. And and this is where I uh, really help, encouraged me to sort of reread Ryman in, in this direction. Anyone else? Greg, do you mind speaking into the microphone for me? Along those lines, uh, I was wondering... No pun intended, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, pun, no pun intended. <laughs> but unfortunately executed. <laughs> um, along those lines. Um, I'm wondering about the, the function of support in Ryman, which I find curious that you uh, uh, prefer to talk about the the event uh, of the language event, which I found very productive of the the painted stroke, uh, but much has been discussed about uh, the relationship of uh, surface to support 
in Ryman's work. So I was wondering if you could elaborate further on, uh, in view of uh, the ideas that you've marshaled from uh, Merleau-Ponty and Bergson, perhaps, uh, or the debate between Einstein and Bergson, how the this, this support functions in relationship to the object nature of the work or the ob object status of the work? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, uh, uh, my most immediate response is, is that, I, I mean, I, I think that Ryman is, ha, had been successful in foregrounding these sort of objective properties of, 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 uh, of for example, a painting, uh, which not only includes uh, the actual properties of the painting, but the, 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 the uh, uh, things that we anticipate uh, with respect to where a painting will be located where it's supposed to be, you know, like on a wall or, you know, hanging and so forth. Uh, and uh, what I, I, and so my immediate thought was that, that um, uh, what's important is that he, he produced a, a hybrid in, environment of, of where um, there's a, there's a, a co-presence of, of, of representation and objectification that, um, uh, which, which allows us to re rethink each in terms of the other. That, that uh, uh, any mark or object that is designed to reinforce it, the idea, for example, of, uh, of an architectural trope, uh, there's no, it, it seems to me quite easily we can, can, uh, can, um, find a way of looking at that trope as a, as a form. And the, the, the reason why it has that kind of elasticity is because he, I think he produced this hybrid space. The, I mean, the, the, the relationship between Stella and, and uh, Ryman is telling in that respect because Stella decided not to use uh, a, 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 you know, sort of painterly tropes in, objecti in his effort of objectification. And, and so I can't help but to think that Ryman liked painting. You know, I mean, I, not, you know, I don't, I don't know. In later Stella, uh, you know, I think, you know, maybe he began to like painting again. But, you know, I, I, I you know, I, you know, I, I think that uh, he uh, wasn't interested in thinking. Uh, he was thinking. He's interested in thinking outside of painting. He wasn't thinking. Interested in thinking or moving painting along in terms of its interiority. And, and I think Ryman was. And, 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 to, and to do that, you're already within sort of a, a space uh, uh, where you have to think of, of, of uh, you know, language events as well as objective, of, of, of these manifestations of, of of ob objectivity, these manifestations of of, uh, um, of, of, of uh, things as objects, and and in so doing, and this is and, and this is something that is connected to my own practice, that we can imagine that you know that ideas of that we can rethink the idea that ideas of, of the subjective ideas of will, ideas of of intentionality and design, we can re, we can we can think them as more in, t in terms of a semiotic a a structure rather than uh, uh, something that is a, a product of our intuition or, or, or style of expression. So we can re re reassign the the, the 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 sort of regular manifestations of exp of the expressive object in such a way that with the idea of human expression isn't quite necessary. You know, it's just because of the hybrid space that that he, he produced. So it, it, to me, it was very intentional uh, that 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 he was interested in in, in brushwork. Okay, maybe one more question. Anybody over here? That's her. Sorry. Just going to ask you to speak into the microphone. If I may rebound from what you just said, 
I, I find that very interesting that the, that you describe um, Ryman's practice as a as a sort of respect for the objectivity of the paint of the material of the stroke of the viscosity of the of the paint and all that and a sort of side tra side, putting on the side intentionality will and replacing that with a with maybe a mental construct or something but i also think i think that's absolutely true in Ryman's work but isn't there another aspect of subjectivity that I, I see as preponderant in, in Ryman's work, which is the after, after the fact, appreciation, judgment, decision. Like it seems to me that Ryman always uh, puts something down on the canvas to see what the paint will do. And that the ne next comes a judgment that accepts or doesn't accept what the paint has done. And, and that, that, that in the end, he has like, like this kind of dialogue where it's not so much the intentionality, which is always like before the act actually, but rather the judgment after the act that defines his subjectivity as a painter. What would you? Another question that's impossible to answer. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the similar kind of question comes up with respect to my work. You know, that, as you, not, as you know, that, that uh, because uh, as I claim uh, uh, that, uh, that I uh, substitute my own will or intention, uh, I use the system to, as a substitute for my will and intention, and, and, and that uh, uh, there is this difficulty in locating uh, exactly where that release is that is that at some point my will is involved. So, so like uh, uh, it's, it's involved in coming up with the idea of the system itself and its application. Right, for example, and uh, and what and the debate is always about whether uh, that's not a, a, the same type of subjectivity that go that might go in and, and for, for example making a conscious design a, com a conscious compositional design. Uh, 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 it's, it's, it's part of the painting process, and, and, and my, my uh, uh, the only way, and this may not be, may not be a, a convincing argument at all, but my only way, is, uh, the only thing that I would suggest is that, it's, so I'll, be, I'll say it in my case, then I'll, my, I'll make this comparison with Ryman, but in my case, it's, it's that uh, uh, there's, there's not, a, a, a desire to uh, you know, a, a, to deny the, the subjectivity or uh, or become a, sort of a, uh, like Einstein an, an absolutist in terms of in terms of empirical uh, strategies. Uh, it's it's to it's to show the in, uh, the the operation of subjectivity uh, subjectivity is a, a, a more indeterminate process. And, and, and that, uh, so th that uh, uh, I, am, I have no reservation of making judgments or decisions that are given to me. I just don't want to create the decisions, you see. And, and, uh, and so that is the only the way I can compare it, it to what you're saying about um, uh, Ryman, that as the, uh, uh, the, the process of uh, where he spe is, is, is speculates or reflects upon what he's done is that given the fact that he's, he was determined to create a, a space of obje objectification, he then is responding to the space that he's produced. And, and uh, so I think, I think that's different than the old model, the old model of, 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 of willful production. It might not be, but I, but I think that that makes it a little different. Okay, take one more. John. I was very interested in your remarks on the real, and in fact, what you had to say about the real was beyond my capacity to absorb it as a listener. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading it. But I'm wondering if, for me, 
you might speak about the real in Ryman with regard to the real in your work. In your work, I think of the real as the referent, the tree that is sort of in the world that is somehow um, unapproachable and that your work is a kind of meditation upon, about how we represent it, how we approach it, how we think about it. Um, but it's a reference, it's a thing in the world. For me, the real in Ryman is the paint, the surface, the support. It's a very tactile real that's right here with us. And I'm wondering if you might help me to understand what you're saying about the real in Ryman with regard to the real in your work, if that's possible. Well, with respect to, to Ryman, uh, I, I, in the paper I, I, I uh, describe, you know, uh, it, uh, it, there's the assumption of objects and things as, as real. And, and so this is, a, this is an assumption, it's a characterization or a definition of what we might consider the real in, in, the, in, in that case, in the, in the case of Ryman. But also sort of a comment on the fact that, that um, uh, that uh, that there is this there is this continuing debate on it. That is to say that uh, uh, that uh, within within that particular example, uh, the the real being the object uh, that that. Uh, the, the terms of, of that is, uh, the, th those terms are defined by t t two things, that one sort of cultural agreement and also empirical uh, evidence. So, so that we, if we have an object, a thing that we, that we consider real, like this microphone uh, or this table, if, if we come to the conclusion that it's real, uh, the, the, the terms of that is simply that um, uh, it, it is real in so, only insofar as we have culturally Agree, but it also assumes that there is that the how we experience the table contributes to the force of that cultural agreement. That, that is that the empir empirically that is that is that uh, that this is a certain sort of composition of elements that we experience our senses that somehow can be uh, described as existing not just subjectively but in, but from the standpoint of various uh, uh, observers, that that they are seeing the same patterns, uh, you know, they're, they're they're experiencing the same st stimulants, and and that 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 this then contributes to uh, uh, that agreement, because because if you if you push it to its lo sort of logical or logical extent, then the the the, 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 the notion of a reality can only be de determined by. Uh, um, if uh, we can f find a, a way of becoming the thing we're observing, uh, that is, that that if, if we uh, 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 can uh, uh, bypass or, or, or overcome the fact that, as you call it, the tree, the, the reference is, is an object of, is, as the object of our observation, that we can actually be in the moment of the object itself. You know, it would be the same as that object and. And, and, and so, and, 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 and clearly we can't do that. So the, so the next best thing is to, to try to find, uh, it, as I was trying to explain it in the paper, there's empiricists, uh, to try to, to, to substitute that by finding laws, or, or finding those laws that we find in, that, that are in common, that can help sustain an idea of something that, that, that's real. But the other part of it is, is it has to do with subjectivity, that, that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, you know what is what Israel is 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 mediated by our subjectivity. You know we we can come to to truths about that. That that there's no way in the world, as is suggested in the example I gave you, in terms of becoming singular with the with the object of our our, our perception, uh, 
the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the only uh, uh, alternative to that is rather than directing ourselves to that singularity, uh, focusing, focusing on our, 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 ourselves, our subjectivity as the singularity. So the reality is, is the matter in which, I, in which I subjectively experience it. This, be, this becomes the real. And, uh, and so there is, there, there, and in the paper, I tried to say that modernism has created a sort of uh, a problematic debate between this, these two, these two uh, uh, factors. Uh, it, uh, so in, in uh, uh, Ryman, I think he is thinking of the empirical object. With me, I'm thinking of the of this subjective intervention into the object. You know, and so, so, uh, so the, we're, I, it, maybe we we are sort of riding along the 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 the, the, polar, the you know the, the polar split that modernism has produced, and he's occupying one side and I the other, even though our aims are seemingly similar. Uh, uh, but th that's the way that I would describe the difference between between uh, what he's doing. Then take one more. Okay, I'll take one more. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Um, I want to um, sort of put together what Greg and Terry um, suggested, and maybe one can think about subjectivity and contingency as a type of hinge. It strikes me that if one were to think about the grid, not necessarily as a sign of objectivity, but as an alibi of reason. The, you know, the way that um, the grid extends in all directions, you know, a lot um, crowds, can be thought of in relationship to contingency. And I want, I mean, I went to the Ryman show a couple of times, I haven't been um, recently, but one piece that really strikes me as doing that and on some level, you know, and this is really speaking to the notion of the structure or the substrate, is the piece where it is essentially physically a rectangle, but, um, when, but because it is lit in a certain way, um, the shadow that is created is a square. All right, so on some level, I think, you know, of course, it exists within, you know, the, the eyes of the beholder, you know, the, the beholder share creates this square. But I think it also says something about um, a contingency as a type of, as a quality of time, as a sort of attention um, that is perhaps similar to what you were describing in Bergson, in that the viewer, uh, tries to, may not achieve, but tries to exist with the work of art according to the work of art's own time. So, I, I mean, I, I wonder if one can think about contingency in relationship to different orders of time. I mean, we can go on and on about subjectivity, you know, after difference, after post-structuralism, but maybe this is one way of thinking about um, the ground and the substrate. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree with, the, uh, with your analysis. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it, 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 is, it echoes both Bergson and, and uh, Merleau-Ponty. That, uh, that, you know, that we've come to, you know, particularly in the postmodern era, we've come to pretty sort of, a pretty, Nouveau concepts of of, this, of subjectivity, but their concepts are really old school, and and it it, it, uh, and it what you call the contingence is is what Bergson argued is a product of vision. What well, Merleau-Ponty calls the product of, of vision, that uh, our relationship to objects is always continuously contingent, uh, in, in a way that I tried to exp to explain. Uh, because uh, we have a, a, a multiplicity of, of, of perspectival positions respect in, with respect to the object. And, and the, this undermines the idea of a, of a, of a singular uh, gridding or a singular contour. 
as, as, as a kind of, as it's a type of contingency. And, uh, and uh, Merleau-Ponty's discussion of the line is, a, you know, I use the, the, the metaphor of the event horizon that, uh, that is constantly moving away from you and also moving past you. You know, you know the, the, where is the viewer in that kind of dynamic, you know, it, 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 with respect to the object? It has to be, you, your word of the contingent has to be a good description of what, what that is. Thank you, Charles. Obviously gave us a lot to think about, so. Thank you everyone for coming.